So I'm going to talk about the, uh, the failures, the successes, and the future of the CSS, in particular in the CSS working group that I'm co-chairing at the World Wide Web Consortium. Bert Boss and Oconley invented uh, CSS uh, roughly 20 years ago. If I recall correctly, the first uh, document submitted by Ocon was submitted in October 94. So this is a big day, 20 years. And uh, as you can see, uh, they relax a little bit more now. Uh, Elika, who is uh, driving the boat, is doing a lot of things inside the CSS Working Group. I did not name her, but uh, she is one of the pillars of the CSS Working Group. Uh, it's still a big success. Uh, in the beginning, it was not obvious to see CSS be ubiquitous on the web. There was a challenger called XSL, and now CSS is, as you know, the only styling language on the web. It, it's, it's a big thing. Not too much later, we started the CSS Working Group, uh, if I recall correctly, beginning of 97. The CSS Working Group is, um, is a bunch of crazy geeks coming from the main companies uh, in the software industry like Microsoft, Adobe, Netscape at the time, uh, Apple, Hewlett Packard, everyone. And we are all friends. I mean, we've been working together for roughly 10, 20 years. We, we know very well each other. We, we hang up after the sessions and have a few drinks together. We, we, have, we, know, we, we know us very well, but we fight. And there's blood on, on the walls in the corridors. It's, uh, the sessions are often quite, how can I say that? Controversial, to be very polite. Uh, on Tuesday evening, we had our weekly conference call and it was, again, a little bit controversial. So it, it, it's not exceptional. CSS went a little bit crazy. We, it, sometimes we go too far. Sometimes we do things badly. And there are a few things that we want to fix, we need to fix. Uh, a lot of things that you are using today are the result of years and years of discussions, of compromises, sometimes weak compromises, sometimes better compromises, but it's never the perfect solution for two reasons. First one, we are only humans, and humans do mistakes, as you are going to see. Second, uh, all the browser vendors have their strategy and their schedule, and all the schedules are different, obviously. I mean, when Microsoft wanted to invest on Asian scripts, Asian writing scripts, and Netscape wanted to focus on more, on stuff more directly usable on, on the front-end web, there was a big clash in the CSS working group. One of the big, one of the big things the corporate uh, offers of CSS style sheets I've been wanting for 18 years now is variables. I'm sure that uh, you're all excited about variables. So we will not have variables in CSS. We will have something completely different that will achieve exactly the same goal, but it's not variables. It's called custom inherited properties that you will be able to define yourself. So look at the example. You have uh, uh, the definition of a custom property called corporate color on the body, and it cascades, it's inherited in the tree of the document down to the ID foo, where that color is used, using the functional notation var of corp color, okay? So that mechanism is really well integrated with CSS. It's much better than a, a hash define in, in C or C++, but you are used to hash define. And this is where we are going to have a lot of problems explaining to people why they don't have hash define. So why don't we have hash define after all? Yeah, trolls. I'm, there's a unit in the consortium called the Glazoo, that's me, and the Glazoo is a unit of troublemaking, so I'm pretty famous about that. First one, because it was far too simple. Come on, guys, we can do much worse than that. Second, uh, do you really think we know something about the web? We don't, we are only implementers. And developers, I mean developers of C++ code, some of them are implementing editing rules or layout rules and never wrote a single web page. So there's no surprise here. We love fighting and complain about the consortium being too slow. 
It's yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, this is this is not this is not a joke. It really happened. So we kept fighting and fighting and fighting, and eventually we blamed the consortium for being unable to make a decision. But the we in we fight is the browser vendors. The consortium is an industrial consortium, and only the browser vendors submit things and make decisions. And the last thing, don't you like the dash dash thing? Dash dash corp color. Wonderful, I mean, how many people are going to read that correctly? How many people are going to write only one dash? How, only, how many people are going to use underscores? It's going to be great. <laughs> I, if you want to write a book, a tutorial, that's the right time to do it. Now, there's of course this vertical centering. We've been spending 20 years answering that single question. Why am I unable to vertically center something on the screen? And it's highly time to fix this. And to fix that, we found something super simple <laughs> called the flexible box model. Basically, we have six different properties with super complex values with flex inside, flex outside. We are distributing white space around elements, but of course we have no element in HTML defining white space. It's only white space. I mean, it's, it, it's a white space or a carriage written in your markup. So it's not going to be easy at all. And only the people dealing with application UI, uh, people coding in Qt, in WX, WX widgets or stuff like that, or Motif, will know what we are going to deal with. It's, it's, it is going to be complex for web offers unless you have a, a graphical editor, uh, an ID able to do it for you. So uh, for the time being, that document is in less call working draft stage, meaning that it's time to start uh, implementation because we have a new process in the consortium. We're never able to stabilize things. Um, I hope that Flexbox is going to be a proposed recommendation in, let's say, a year from now if we have enough tests uh, to do everything. Uh, of course, testing this is a big beast. We have to have probably thousands and thousands of tests. Of course, an endless opportunity to rename things. So look at these five names. These are five property values for Flex. Two of them start with flex dash. The third one has no flex, and the two last ones start with space. Uh, again, when, when there's any hope to do something bad, we do it bad, trust us. And this, I mean, these five values are the result of hours and hours of discussions. Uh, eventually, we are going to change them. It's, don't look at them, I mean, don't, don't, don't write them. They're going to change. Fortunately, we are doing a few things really, really right. And uh, there are really cool new features arriving in CSS um, attached to magazine layout, for instance. All the things that you can see in printed press, we are going to have them on the web. For instance, exclusions. Uh, the one on the left, when you have text, floating around an, an image with an alpha channel, and you want the text to really be close to the image. This is the kind of things that we are able to do now with exclusions. This is also exclusions, but with regions, okay? So we have a flow of content coming from one region of the document and flowing into others. So that could be columns, but you can do more complex things. For instance, for people used to write scientific documents using LaTeX, uh, La tech in French, where you have a title, an excerpt, and then one paragraph, and then columns. This is the kind of things that you can do with regions. We are also doing much better things that we used to do with baselines and alignment of content. Uh, when you have uh, very precise typographic requirements for printed press, aligning stuff in a newspaper, we're nowadays unable to achieve that on the web. And we want to, to, to reach that because the press is pushing. People like National Geographic, Wired, these kind of magazines, they all want to move to the web entirely to have exactly the same rendering on the web and on the print. 
So we are doing a lot of efforts there. Adobe uh, is instrumental in this effort. They are submitting a lot of things, contributing a lot of patches to, to WebKit and Blink, uh, and Gecko also, if I recall correctly. So this is going to happen. This is going to land in a browser near you uh, anytime soon. It's already in WebKit or Blink, I don't remember. Uh, if you download Chromium in the flags, you, you can enable this immediately. Filters, friends, compositing, masking, you know, shaders, uh, filters. There are a lot of things coming uh, to, to the browser. Uh, we are able to do much more things than we, we, we used to do. Uh, you can play with images, you can play with 3D, you can animate a page. Uh, this is not only for cool special effects. It's also for real, real usages uh, of, of modern tablets or telephones or laptops. For instance, anytime you are viewing an electronic book on your tablet, an EPUB, you are flipping pages. This is the kind of things a filter and a shader are able to do with WebGL. And it should be standardized. It should be pluggable through CSS with one single line of declarative stuff. For the time being, all the ebook e readers are re-implementing this in C++ or in JavaScript with Canvas and FX and WebGL. This is, this is completely suboptimal. We can do much better than that. Uh, the, the image on the bottom right is just a regular font with compositing on a background image. And it looks like it's printed uh, and it's a single image. In fact, it is not. It's real text. There's markup there. This is the kind of things we are going to be able to do in, in the next months on the web. It's really cool. Selectors 4. So this you understand and practice probably a little bit better. Uh, we have a few new cool, kid, new cool kids in Selectors 4. Uh, mainly four, in my opinion. Colon Matches. Matches was suggested roughly 15 years ago. It's not here yet. And we have no examples explaining in the spec why it is useful. So uh, maybe we will eventually fix this. Uh, we have column matches because we are unable to have a subject selector. Uh, as you know, when we have a selector, the subject of the selector, the, the, the element that you match, is always the last one matched by the last sequence in the selector. We want to do better than that. And for instance, be able to select a div containing a P, okay? Instead of selecting a P inside a div. And the way we wanted to do that is adding a descriptor somewhere. No, it was too simple. Someone suggested colon matches. Uh, colon not for the timing takes only one simple selection. Uh, one simple selector, sorry. One type selector, one class, one pseudo class. We are going to extend this to very complex uh, selectors and group of selectors. This is useful. Colon has uses rel relative selectors. And this is going to be a total mess in terms of parsing and in terms of object model because all O parser assumes that the first thing when you start a selector is a selector, it's not a combinator. And here, with colon has, you start with a combinator. This is going to be tricky. Uh, the last one is, uh, is an extra argument to the uh, nth child, nth of type, uh, pseudo classes that, are, that is going to be really useful. When you have a list of uh, elements, for instance, uh, a UL with LIs, uh, you want to style them, or in a table you want to have a financial layout with gray and white rows. Uh, you're able to do that only if you skip the hidden rows. And to do that, you have to have a selector in Enschild. Otherwise, you are styling the hidden rows, and you don't want to do that. So this is going to be used. Some stuff are really poorly designed. Uh, I will go through that quickly. Will change. Will change is an optimization for the browsers. And there's, I, I hope this is readable. Uh, Mozilla considered putting a limit on this because it's, if it's used too much, it is going to have a counter effect, diminishing the performance instead of increasing it. So in my opinion, it's completely poorly designed. Um, the selectors for shadow DOM and web components are so <sighs> unbelievably complicated that I, it's going to be very complex for offers to manipulate them. Uh, Google pushed too fast on this, wanted to have a solution as fast as possible. And when we do things fast, 
the compromises are too weak and it leads to trouble. And we have trouble now. So, word nomination. Uh, but of course, we are going to rename that again. Uh, extensibility. The web is full of polyfills, just everywhere. Every time we do a polyfill about CSS, we, we need to parse the CSS, plug things, extend the selectors, have layout extensions that we deal with, creating anonymous elements somewhere in the tree. This is completely suboptimal. We need to do much better than that. The CSS parser should be reachable. You should be able to parse the selectors, have an object model representing them that you could deal with, plug things into them. We should be able to parse the values. For instance, when you have a linear gradient and you want to access the values into, into that, you need to reparse them yourselves. That is completely wrong. We need to do a full extensibility model for the future of CSS. Similarly, for media queries and pseudo classes, we need to be able to plug a JavaScript code to a user-defined media query or a user-defined pseudo class. That JavaScript code returns a Boolean, and this is the result of the media query of the pseudo class. And done, you have an extension to, to your CSS parser and your CSS style sheets. That's trivial to do, that's trivial to achieve. We still need a, a consensus and a compromise on that. And last point, and I will end in time, we need an access to the box tree. The box tree is the part of the layout system of the browser that you never see, that you're unable to reach through uh, JavaScript, that creates the layout of the, of the physical boxes in the frame buffer of the screen. So that means that for the time being, you're unable to create new boxes on the fly, programmatically. You're unable to create new pseudo elements. You're unable to do your own layout if you need it. And if we want real polyfills to extend CSS, we need to do that. And this is the way to do it. We are currently discussing this extensibility mechanism for the future of CSS. And this is the end. And I still have 30 seconds. Yes! yes.